University of Chicago Alumni Club of New York, welcomes you to the 2009 Summit City Event Program. Tonight's event is Opportunities in uh, the Classroom, Career, and Education. This is a panel discussion with the University of Chicago alumni who are education professionals, and they're here to discuss their insights and perspectives on the career path in education. The format of the event will be a roughly 45 minute discussion among the panelists. And then we'll open up the event to Q&A with the audience, and then there'll be some time for you to network afterwards. What I would like to do right now is first thank the participants of the panel for coming together with us today. <laughs> and then I'm going to give a small introduction for each of the panelists because they all introduce themselves as well, and then the event will begin. Starting from my right is Alina Balsamia, AB01. She's a program specialist with the United Nations Development Program. Michael Charles Wiener, MBA 97. He's a president of AccuTutor. Rajananda, AB and AM 88. He's the assistant principal at the High School of Finance and Economics. Would you like to get that back there? Close enough. <laughs> to his right, Greg Gunn, AB 91. He's chief scientist and co-founder of Wireless Generation. To his right is Jane Quinn, AM SSA 69, assistant executive director of community schools Children's Aid Society, and the lady who's helped us graciously host the event here in the building. <laughs> and Russell Miller, SM91, PhD, OO, Associate Professor of Math at Queens College, Thank you. And the leader will be moderating the event. Hi, Did you have some of these? Yes, they're on the test okay. at the end. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. We have a great panel in front of us. Um, as Reggie mentioned, we'll have um, about 45 minutes of a few questions and answers with the panelists, and then we'll open up the floor to questions that you all may have. So um, I'd like to start off with just asking each of the panelists to tell them, to tell us a little a bit about themselves, what they do, and what inspired them to enter the education field. So maybe starting with Russell at the end. Well, so um, we should all mention our Chicago connection somehow here. Yeah. Um, University of Chicago is where I got my master's degree and my doctorate in mathematics. Uh, did that because I was thinking that a career in mathematics would be a good thing. That, of course, means both research and teaching. And so the, the doctorate is essentially training for doing research, but usually as a way of supporting yourself during graduate study. Um, teaching is required too, and it pretty much stays that way the, thereafter. Um, so on the one hand, there are a lot of people in my shoes who essentially look at teaching as what you have to do so that you can get paid to work on all those interesting math problems. Um, there are others, of course, who too much more seriously than that. Um, for myself, the, the interesting background note here is that at Chicago, for four years, I worked in a program run by Professor Paul Sally, who I respect some of you who did not say that. Um, he, he ran a number of different programs, but this one was for Chicago Public Schools teachers uh, who had uh, gotten jobs teaching mathematics without necessarily having the requisite background for teaching mathematics, and who needed a certain amount of training to get up to the level that one would like math teachers to be at. And so we tried to give them that training, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. But um, that, that gave me insight, in some ways, into the te those teachers themselves. They, they were mostly not even high school. They were primarily and maybe junior high math teachers. Um, and then also a little bit into just the notion of health education. Um, all of us here are in education, I think. I'm the one who comes closest to adult education. Basically for me at this point, that means college, but a little bit of background with teaching the teachers as well. Um, finished at Chicago, I spent three years as a postdoc, which is a fairly standard move for somebody who is doing research as well as teaching. And then I came here in 2003, and I've taught in the city university, Queens College, Graduate Center ever since. Yes, Joe. Yeah, okay. So, hi, I'm Jane Quinn. I welcome you to the United Charities building. This is um, this building was built in 1892, 
And so it's very historic and it has a lot of good karma, I think, so I, I welcome you here. Um, I work for the Children's Aid Society, which is the oldest and largest youth organization in New York City. It's actually older than this building. It was um, founded in 1853. So very proud history, and I was happy to learn that Raj got his teeth straightened by a Children's Aid Society dentist some years ago, and lots of people have connections to our, our organization. What I do on my job as Assistant Executive Director for Community <coughs> Schools is really a lot of stuff. I have a great job. I get to work both locally and nationally on um, a reform strategy that's called Community Schools, and it's about uh, schools that partner with community resources to extend the learning opportunities for children through after-school programs and summer camps, Saturday academies, and also um, partners like us bring services into schools like dental programs, medical, mental health, and social services. So we are partners with <coughs> 20 public schools in New York City. They're in Washington Heights, East Harlem, and the South Bronx, so in very low-income neighborhoods. And in addition, I direct a, techni a national technical assistance center, so I get to travel across the country and do a lot of teaching. So I also am involved in adult education. I have a master's in social work from the University of Chicago, and I got that 40 years ago this month. And I've been working all 40 of those years. <laughs> Jane, thank you. Greg? Uh, my name is Greg Gunn, and I'm uh, co-founder and chief scientist of a company called Wireless Generation uh, that I founded uh, with, a, with my partner in 2000. And uh, our company does uh, develop software mostly for early reading, assessment, and instruction. Uh, but we also build large-scale data systems. We were one of the companies involved in the development of New York City's ARIS data system, which you might have heard some things about. Um, so it, the, I got my start, sort of, well, going back, it's, when I was in high school, I made, I made my money after school. I made half of my money uh, tutoring other kids for their SATs, and I made the other half of my money writing software for a, a local instrumentation company. And sort of this always having two jobs, you know, a day job teaching and a night job writing software or vice versa seemed to continue as a pattern. Um, it, and at University of Chicago, I was in another one of Paul Sally's programs uh, where I was, and this was actually math enrichment uh, for kids who were uh, mostly middle schoolers and, and early high schoolers. Uh, and so I was a physics major by day, but, by, but you know, on my weekends, I was always working with kids. So after many subsequent years of doing one or the other at any given time, I decided to fuse the two. Uh, so my day job would be both teaching and both education and software. Uh, and so that's how I came to start the company. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Raj Danda, and uh, I grew up here in New York City, went to public school three in the West Village, and then IS-70 on 18th Street. And then I was fortunate enough to go to Stuyvesant High School, and I spent a year in India in high school and came back and went to the University of Chicago for my undergraduate degree, which I got in uh, early American history, something very useful that we teach a lot of, <laughs> not really, in um, high school. Um, but while I was there, I was also able to get a master's degree. And um, for those of you who are getting a master's degree, they're not very useful unless you're going to become a teacher because then you get paid more. So um, I got a master's degree while I was at uh, the university. And my first job, I always wanted to be a teacher. I'd been a coach and a camp counselor. and. Um, been an assistant woodworking person at the Children's Aid Society and sort of always been working with young people and always loved history. And my first job was at a horrible private school, which doesn't exist anymore. It was a misery of a job. And I lasted there about six or seven months before um, I left, got fired, quit. I'm, not, I'm still not sure exactly what happened. Um, and uh, so I, after that, I subbed in a lot of different schools. And for the next two or three years, I bounced around from a couple of different public schools. I was always lowest on the totem pole, so they used to do something called excessing, which is that at the end of the year, they would count up the number of kids or the beans in the school, and um, if they didn't have enough kids, then they would sort of have to let someone go. So I lost my job twice in the middle of the year as the population of Manhattan schools went down and the outer boroughs went up. Eventually, I landed at Martin Luther King High School, which is this huge high school on the Upper West Side, uh, over 3,000 kids. Um, uh, the school had broken up into mini schools. I was in the science technology mini school. I worked as a 
great advisor. I got very involved in the American Social History Project at CUNY, which is a fantastic program. It sort of revolutionized my teaching and, and really opened my eyes to interdisciplinary education. Um, in the Department of Education, if you get a certain number of credits, you get more money. So I decided to get my more credits in administration, never thinking that I would ever become an assistant principal. But be careful of what you don't wish for. Um, because my assistant principal left one day in the middle of summer, and I got a call while I was down in Brazil from my friend saying, hey, the day you come back, put on a tie and come in and talk to Stephanie, I think she's going to hire you as the new assistant principal. Um, and I did that for five years at Martin Luther King High School, which eventually broke up partly because there was a, a shooting on my floor of <laughs> a student who brought in a, a gun and shot one of the other kids. Um, uh, no one was really injured. It was comical in the end, I suppose, but uh, traumatic nonetheless. And it, brought about the close of that high school, and it's now, I think, five or six small high schools in that building. Um, and I moved to the High School of Economics and Finance, which is one of the first small boutique high schools. I don't know what you want to call it, but it has a theme. And it's located down on uh, Trinity Place, right near Wall Street. It's in the old NYU Business School building. And it's a, it's a wonderful school, as Martin Luther King was in a lot of ways as well. And I've been there for about five or six years. And um, I teach one class in Advanced Placement U.S. History and I supervise the English and History departments, but also art and music, um, the business department, uh, the library, foreign language, um, which is troubling since my Spanish is faulty and I know nothing about business, but we're making a go of it. All right, great, thank you, Raj. Michael? Hi, I'm Michael Weiner, MBA 97. Uh, my company is AccuTutor, which provides tutoring for um, all sorts of subjects, but primarily it's K to 12, math, reading, foreign languages, the things that kids take in school day to day. Um, I'm somewhat of an accidental educator. Uh, I got my MBA so that I could go work for big companies like Nestle and market products that some people want, some people don't want, but to make them want them more. And I did that for about seven and a half years. Over that time, I works. I have to recount every now and then. I worked for 17 people in seven and a half years. And those were just direct bosses. And after my last job moved, because two of my three offices did move, um, I took my severance and spent some time figuring out what I wanted to do because I wasn't really sure that a career in marketing where I you know, was always running around, there was always a new boss, uh, someone wasn't French so he was, he was fired, someone wasn't Swiss so he, you know, that person was fired, um, the things that you're not really supposed to see happen in you know, happy corporate culture. And so after a time I decided I wanted my own corporate culture and that I wanted to be the boss and I was tired of you know, always wondering you know, what politics I have to play today instead of doing my work. So I didn't leave marketing because so much I didn't like marketing. In fact, this summer I'm doing marketing consulting. Uh, marketing is a wonderful profession if you know, that's something that you get into. But I decided that I wanted something, if I was going to be the boss, I wanted something I could really care about, really sink my teeth into. And that's why I chose education. I suppose my inspiration was from my father, who grew up poor on the west side of Denver, and nobody in his family had ever even seen rounds of a college before. But both he and his older brother became doctors, and my father moved to New York because he wanted a big city. And so it seemed to me that whatever you do in life, if you have education, it can really not be taken away from you unless your mind goes. But you can get fired from a job. You can get pushed aside, and you might have to move to another city. But if you have education, you always have something. And you can always start over. And so I decided that I wanted that for my company so that you know, whether or not the kids were well off, it didn't really matter because you know, people need to get educated so that they can do the best that they can in whatever profession they choose. And so that's sort of how I came about it. Um, as I said, my company is primarily K-12 education. Uh, I never thought that I would actually be a tutor, and I do some adult education myself in computers. Um, I consider myself a spreadsheet kind of guy. That's what you do a lot of in marketing. And so... That's what I teach. I have a few clients now, and you know, that's just my own clients. And really the focus of my company, though, is getting to know people, um, you know, finding new clients just through working with schools, um, word of mouth, and I guess you know, just leaping ahead a little bit, um, a word of advice, if you're going to have a private company of any kind in education, uh, it actually would be useful to have a background in education because then you, you actually have connections and you know people um, something that I've learned by trial and error, um, and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Um, but there's certainly some differences in the way I've come to education than some of my fellow panelists. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Michael. That's a great segue, actually, to um, the next
next area we, want, we wanted to discuss, which is some of you already covered this, in that um, the steps you maybe took to take to where you are right now and what your current profession is. Um, it would be great if you could tell the audience what are some maybe do's and don'ts, maybe add on to what you already discussed, but also any do's and don'ts in your field. I know that um, currently where I'm working, we're going through a lot of recruitments, and you read these cover letters or you see these applications, mm -hmm. and it's just red flags. Mm -hmm. And it, if they even just talk to someone, mm -hmm. anyone in that field, they would have known, don't put this, you need this kind of qualification. And so um, please pay attention carefully because this is going to be invaluable advice. So maybe mm -hmm. starting with Jane this time, mm -hmm. and we'll go around that way. <laughs> yeah, I remember one time I was hiring for a job, um, I was working at a national youth organization and I made the mistake of putting an ad in the New York Times and I got 350 resumes. Do you know what that looks like when it comes in and hits your desk? Yes. Yeah. And I saw like some amazing cover letters. One, the worst of them was one that had one sentence in the middle of the page and it was you know, something about what a wonderful person he was. I was like, Shh, throw that out, right? I do think uh, a, a do is to do your homework. I think that, uh, and I, I'm going to pick up where Michael left off. I also think that there's no substitute for networking. I mean, there's some amazing statistic about how what percentage of jobs in America are are the connections are made through networking rather than through what seem like more kind of traditional channels. So um, I think that, that that's good advice. I also I did a couple of things early in my career that I. I may not be applicable to you, but I think it's important to think about what is going to set your resume and your qualifications apart from other people. And I did two things that really have helped me a lot. One is that I started to write very early. I got things published because I, and I'm not a researcher, I'm a practitioner, but I knew that that was like a credential on your resume. And it also happened to fit with my skill set. But the other thing was that I learned how to raise money. Now, I figured out early on in my career that if I was going to have a career in social work, that, that part of what needed to be in my toolbox was a, a skill of fundraising. And I also knew, because I've looked at the want ads in the New York Times and in, you know, in the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and you know, if you know how to raise money, you'll never be unemployed. So I figured, you know, if by some chance we hit hard economic times, uh, I, would, I would not be unemployed. So those were a couple of things. I did think strategically about that early on in my career. And the other thing was I found mentors. Sometimes they found me, sometimes I found them, but I was always trying to find particularly women in my field who were 10 or 20 years older than I was who could really kind of take me under my wing, under their wing and teach me things. And, and I have never regretted that. And now I do a lot of mentoring of younger people. So if people call me and ask me to do an informational interview or to give them advice, I, I never say no. Great, thank you. So Craig, do's and don'ts, tips and advice you can give to the audience. All right, well, I, I have one don't, and I see this all the time on education mm -hmm. resumes, which is, I went to high school, so I understand education. And it's like, no, don't, yeah. don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so it's, it's the idea okay. that, the, you know, the education, there's certainly the experience of going through it, which may give you a lot of insights about, about the experience of it, but when we're talking about education as a profession, we're talking about you know, a very different, you're talking about looking at it from the other side. Um, and, and so when, and you know, I hire, I'm a private company, you know, we're a for-profit company, and we hire all kinds of people, some with education backgrounds, some not. Um, but it always is a plus when, when somebody has thought thought a little bit more deeply about some issue in education, you know, about, you know, I, you know, I was, you know, if, if for some people, you know, they may be, inter they may be interested or, or motivated by what's happening to minorities in education, they may be interested in what's happening to women in education, they may be interested in what technology can do for education. There are lots of, <coughs> lots of issues and sort of questions, you know, at least have thought about, you know, some, some interesting question in, in a little bit of depth or, or read about it. But in general, it's even you know, sort of going to your point, you know, always being able to sell something that's, that's strong about yourself. 
you know, when, even if it doesn't seem directly relevant, you know, if you're if you're a good writer, you know, if you're a great project manager, you know, a project manager who a project manager from any field can be valuable in education because education is whether you're on the nonprofit or for-profit side of it, it's a very all the jobs tend to be very complex, very multitasking, and so if you're if you're a good project manager and have great multitasking skills, that's always something that's useful to play out. So um, there are other ones, but probably not worth fun. Okay, great. And Greg, you also touched on what Jane was mentioning about doing your homework, knowing who your audience is, not writing silly things in cover letters. Um, I know that a similar thing that I see in cover letters as well is that, well, I have a degree in development, and so international development, at least in my field, and therefore I need to graduate from Columbia School of International Public Affairs, and you should hire me. It's like, yes, so do the other 100 applicants that applied for your same position. So you kind of have to take a step back and realize that you are just one drop in the puddle, and there are so many other people applying for your positions. And so just think twice before you write certain things in cover letters. All right, Raj. It's not so true in my case. I don't have too many U of C grads applying for jobs in the public schools. I don't. And I always thought that experience would mean a lot, but I do look at where people go to college. Um, and I like to see that you know they have master's degrees from from good schools. I didn't think I always would, um, but it is something. That, you know, if I see a resume with a spelling mistake or something like that, I just throw it in the garbage because my school is very centrally located, so we tend to have a lot of people apply. Um, some of the things that I think that are very useful if you want to be a teacher. And I don't know how many people here. I think just show hands. How many people think they're interested in being a teacher? Um, <clears throat> the first year of teaching is the hardest year you'll ever have in your life. I think that's pretty true. I, I, and be prepared for that. And acknowledge it, embrace it. Feel the pain. Um, <laughs> it's an exciting year, but I think, you know, when you go for your first job, um, you know, be conscious that the person's gonna look at you, you've never taught before, why am I gonna hire you? So, you know, be conscious of the fact that you're open to that. Um, I always tell people that, you know, the best thing they can do if they want a job in teaching is to get themselves a MetroCard Fund Pass and start on the one train at 256th Street, wherever the one train starts, and just make their way down Broadway, stopping at every school and dropping their resume off. Um, I mean, I, I accept resumes through faxes, and though they don't look so good when they come through a fax, I mean, I'll, I'll read it. Um, but there's nothing like having someone stop by and say, uh, hey, you know, I heard about your school and I'm really interested and I just thought I'd, I'd stop by. A lot of times you won't get past the security guard at the front door, but I've hired people who have, I happened to have a free minute, I was on my way out for a cup of coffee and said, hey, why don't you walk with me for a few minutes and tell me a little bit about yourself. And I may not have a job right now, but if I've met you and, you know, can put a face with that name that's on the resume, I'll make a note of it, and that's, and that's something. And certainly if you have a friend who's in the school or somehow you can, that's great. Be flexible. You're looking to come to me and you want to teach history, but here's what I can also do. I can also, you know, I'd be interested in teaching a beginner Japanese class or running an anime club or doing a, a cooking class after school or, you know, I want people like that. I don't want just people going to go into their classroom, shut the door, and teach their five periods a day. Uh, there are a million of those people. What else can you bring to the table? And talk about the fact that you're comfortable working with youth and, you know, this is something you've done tutoring, all those jobs that people describe. I definitely want to hear that. Um, I like to see letters of recommendation attached to the packet, the, you know, the, res the cover letter, the resume, and then occasionally people put, like, a letter of recommendation from someone they work with. Um, if you have a good one, it never hurts. Um, short, you know, sweet, but it's always a good thing. It means that someone else out there has sort of vetted you. And I became an assistant principal. No one ever taught me how to do an interview. I didn't know anything about interviewing, and I made some real mistakes the first couple of times I interviewed people. Um, and I also think that you can't over-prepare uh, for an interview or look too dressed up for an interview. Um, my mother always taught me that. And um, I've had people, when you come to work at my school, we have you do a model lesson. We get some kids in after school, we put them in the classroom, and you actually have to teach a lesson. And uh, some people wing it. And I'm like, if you're winging it, what are you, why are you wasting my time? And then other people come and they're over prepared. They hand it. And I'm like, that's great. You know, even though you may not get to give every handout and go through every part of your lesson, I want to know that you really wanted this job and you were prepared. People come with um, albums showing, you know, examples of student work in their other school, pictures of them leading a field trip to the Ellis Island. Like, I love to see all that. It means that you really care and that you're someone who is going to be a great teacher. Um, so I, I don't think you can over-prepare for those kinds of interviews and really get advice from friends of yours who are teachers and things like that and have them look at your lessons. And uh, Teaching is a real collaborative job and there's nothing wrong with getting lots of advice from people on that. Great. 
Raj, you bring up a really excellent point because enthusiasm, showing your enthusiasm for the position is essential in, I think, any of our fields, but particularly, especially for those of you who want to be teachers, he mentioned the point about if you're going to submit an application, maybe you would want to try and stop by the office and see if you can speak to one of the supervisors there, because especially if, say, you want to be a teacher, they want to see that you're a personable individual, that you can um, be friendly with people, that you might be friend, like comfortable in front of a crowd and teaching, and so um, I think especially for this field, it would be very uh, very useful for your future employer to see that and see how you interact with other people. Um, so moving on to Michael. Uh, I'd like to echo a couple of points that people made. Um, the perfect resume, I'm, I'm shocked all the time because I always think, how can you ever have, especially multiple mistakes on your resume, this is the one thing you control. This comes from you. It's not like you pass it off and someone did your resume and they decided to apply for you. You're applying for a job. You shouldn't have any mistakes at all. And also, it should be appropriate to your field. So, you know, if you want to be a teacher, education might be at the top. If you're looking to do something different where maybe there's more fundraising, fundraising should be at the top. Um, and also, it shouldn't be five pages if you've been out of school for a year. So, I, I've seen mistakes like this. That's an exaggeration, but I did see a three page resume recently for <coughs> someone who'd been out of school for about three years. And, and three pages is a little too long because they didn't have a history that would warrant such a long resume. Um, networking, absolutely. The person who works for me, my director, she came through a recommendation. I wasn't even necessarily looking to hire someone at that time. And someone said to me, here's someone just to meet. And whether or not you know, you're, you're hiring anyone doesn't matter because maybe you know someone who is hiring. And so go into every networking meeting, um, every, you know, every coffee that you have with someone with the attitude that you're going in to inform them of what you want. And hopefully you have something to add to them because maybe they're actually hiring. And you don't have to, you don't have to say, by the way, would you hire me? If they want you, they'll tell you. But also, you're going in there with the attitude that here's what I can do, and maybe this person can connect me to the person who is looking for someone like me. Um, and, I, and I would say another thing that, that sometimes in my past I didn't always do so well, um, when you're looking for a particular job, you, know, you're, you might be applying for different kinds of jobs. They're not all necessarily going to be exactly you know, what I say I'm going to do just that, and that's the only thing I'm applying for. You might apply for different things. If so, you want to have good reasons for that job, good reasons for the things you've done. So if you have an abrupt career change, why did you have this change? Um, and also, why do you want this job? And you should be able to go in and say, here's why I want this job, because these are the skills I have. This is the enthusiasm I have for this field, and you know, I'm going to do a good job for you. And so you know, these things may seem very obvious to you, but over enough of my career in different kinds of positions, I've seen all of these mistakes multiple times. I've seen people make several of them in the same interview. And I think it's just so important that you go in with a good frame of mind. Um, you're, not, you're not looking for this job because I have to pay rent. I mean, yes, that's important. And, and of course, you know, that's implied in having a job. But that's not <coughs> why you want this job. You want this job because of what it is and what you can do and because you're excited for it. Can I just follow on yeah, one of his points? Because one, it, this is one thing that I see a lot, and it's and sometimes it's not in what people say, but it's how they carry themselves into the, into the interview. Sometimes people say things or give off a message that that I'm going into education because because I'm fleeing another profession, or I'm going into education because I think it's going to be better hours, or it's not going to be as hard, or you know, you just, it, it's, um, and when you sense that off of somebody, it's, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly what you don't want to see. Now, it may actually be the case that you're, that part of the thing that triggered you to reconsider your future and think about a career in education is that you were frustrated in another industry. But boy, that cannot be part of, of what you project. What you have, what you project has to be about what you want to get done for kids. Um, and it has to be about you're going to bring your best to it, uh, and it's you know it, it, it may seem obvious to to a lot of folks, but I see it all the time, and people communicate that in very subtle ways. Great, and yeah, I would encourage any of the panelists anytime you want to follow up on another panelist's comments, please feel free to do so. Um, moving on to Russell, um, Russell, you had mentioned um, your educational background. That can be another do in terms of where 
how it got you to where you are today. Um, Raj mentioned flexibility, especially in the teaching profession. You may have been offered a certain teaching you know, position that you didn't like or wasn't your ideal one, but maybe you should have accepted it. So please tell us about some of the do's and don'ts um, in your well, career. So thinking about, I could see at least three different stages or, or different situations to discuss here. Um, let me ask right now, first of all, just are there folks who might be applying for graduate school fairly soon? That I mean, okay. If I see at least a few hands, then, <coughs> then it's worth talking a little bit about that. Um, that's largely a process which doesn't involve any interview or anything of this sort. Um, you do that pretty much blind. Uh, well, okay, not blind, but without actually going and seeing the people or the place that you're applying to, at least until maybe you get accepted and you decide if you actually want to go there. Um, your best contacts there are people at your current school. And so you really should not be afraid to go in, if you're in college now, talk to the professors where you are now about what you're interested in and where, you know, what you hope to do with, with the next few years of your life and where would likely be a good fit for that. Um, they have a good sense of that. And you know, as students, you, you, the, the best thing you can do is to have a bunch of contacts among the professors and use them because they know what's out there and what the possibilities are. Um, they are also people who will likely write letters of recommendation for you and those are the single most important thing when you're applying to graduate school. People at, at Chicago will tell you, oh, we get you know, applications and everybody has perfect scores on their GREs and math and stuff like this. What we decide on is the, the recommendation letters that they send us from their undergraduate professors. So at that stage, that's the advice. You, know, the, you kind of have to rely on other people for the information to make your decision. Okay. Um, there were some exceptions to that. If you're really interested in this, by all means, grab me afterwards. Let's talk. But, um, that situation is kind of different from anything else we were doing here. Um, going further along, uh, when you get to the stage of, if you're applying for jobs in general in academia, one thing, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have some strange, interesting, possibly off-putting, but possibly on-putting things about you. Um, at Queens College this year, I was on a search committee and I, we had one application from somebody who, mathematician, but who was very interested in music and in interactions between math and music. And I suspect there were a lot of places that read that application, that letter, and sort of rolled their eyes and said, this doesn't sound very interesting. Um, so I'm not going to think that way. There are others who, who, I mean, we at Queens College has a very good music school, and so it kind of made sense as a fit there. We said, you know, this could work. Um, and, you know, this guy came in for an interview. It, it was a very good situation. Um, I'm not going to go further than that. But uh, having something like that, whether it's a different interest in academia, whether it's some special aspect of your teaching that you've done. Um, for myself, I know, I mean, I mentioned about the teacher's program that I had taught in. There were several schools that were very interested in me because, you know, I had that and that was different. And some of them said, look, we get all these folks out of graduate school who, who are wonderful at research mathematics and come in and find that they have to teach you know, pre-calculus to, um, I'm thinking of Western Illinois University here in particular, pre-calculus to a bunch of kids off the farm who've just come to college. And they, they were looking for people who had some experience teaching something other than just sort of your basic research institution college course for undergraduates. Um, so don't be afraid to put that in there. Um, Applying at that level often means applying to 30 or 50 schools, and if you can encourage 15 of them and discourage the other 25, say, that's probably a good thing on balance. Um, and then the, the third point, different situation again. Um, so uh, there, is, there is the sort of professor's role, and then there is also adult education more generally, which is very much a, a haphazard thing. Um, adult education, as, as, as opposed to college, you really, I mean, there are plenty of courses that are specifically for adults. They're taught as a part-time job, and it, it's very much ad hoc. Um, 
is, uh, some colleges, many colleges, will have adjuncts who come in and teach a number of their courses. And lots of times they figure out on August 1st or August 20th or August 31st who's going to be teaching for them on September 2nd. Uh, lots of time. It's a world that you want to go into advisably if you, if you want to think about adult education and teaching part time like that. But if you go into it, then definitely it, it's worth knowing a lot of people, doing exactly what was said here, going and meeting folks, and letting them know that you're out there. And even if they have nothing now, it's always possible that something is going to open up on August 28th and you'll get a phone call saying, are you free on Tuesday and Thursday evenings? Or something like that. And that's a good thing. So that's a spot where you need your name out there and you, you just need people to know who you are and know that you are available and that it's at least worth trying to call you and see how your schedule works and can they get you. Um, so different worlds that way. That theme may come up again. I'm much more familiar with first of those worlds, not the, not the adult education, but uh, we can talk about it if people are interested. That's great. Thank you, Russell. Um, so we discussed a lot about the do's and the don'ts, what you need to do, what are some um, things that look good to potential employers, some things that don't. Um, so now you're probably wondering, okay, well, how do I do my homework? What, what do I read? What resources do I have? And so I'd like the panelists maybe to discuss, and we don't have to necessarily go in order, I'd, I'd like to start with Jane since she mentioned the whole homework issue, um, <laughs> but um, two things. What, what do you read to do your homework in your field, all of your very kind of unique um, areas, which is great, we have diversity on this panel, um, but what do you do in terms of preparing for an interview or even looking into potentially entering your field? One, like what resources do you read for current trends in education in that particular field that you're in? And also, um, on the flip side, once you decide that that's what you want to enter, what are some of the job sites and resources appropriate for your field? And the response will be different for the different mm -hmm. panelists, I'm sure, because teaching will be different from um, say engaging in, engaging in tutoring programs and such, and so I know that for each profession, whether it be education or engineering, you have to target um, the different websites and resources that you're going to um, be after differently. So maybe Jane, you can mm -hmm. kick us sure. off with that. And we don't have to necessarily go in order. Sure. You want to just jump in when you want to answer. So, you know, I'm a social worker. I didn't study education, I, I forgot to answer the question of what inspired me to work in schools, and I will say to you that I went to the University of Chicago on a fellowship from the Children's Bureau, and I had to make a commitment to work with or on behalf of children for two years. Forty years later, I'm still working with and on behalf of children, so I think the federal government got a bargain with me. Um, I think what inspires me to work in education is that it's where the kids are. And since I'm interested in working with and on behalf of children, schools seem like a really good place to practice social work, right? Um, so, but as a social worker who you know, reads all the social work literature, when I started getting really involved in working in schools, I had to add some things to my briefcase, right? So the number one thing is Ed Week. I, I read this religiously. I have two subscriptions to it. I have it come to my house as well as to work so that eventually, you know, it's like the New Yorker. It piles up. It does come every week, but it is really a great resource. So I brought a few copies of this if you, you want to, you know, fit, take a look at them. Um, I, I think this is the number one thing to read. It is a national newspaper about current trends in education. It's chock full of news, and it also has a very excellent classified um, classified job section in the back. So I think it's a great, great resource um, for anybody who's in education, but for anybody who's trying to get to understand the trends in education and to understand what's going on nationally, I think that's, or locally, it's a great idea. If you're applying to a local school district, it's really important to stay up on the education news in the local newspapers. And I'm sure you know, because you live in New York, that the newspapers in New York are full of education news um, almost every day. And very different points of view. So if you're in New York, it's probably a good idea, and you're trying to get you know, um, knowledgeable about what's going on, it's probably good to take a look at a couple of different newspapers. Certainly there are wonderful websites. Um, 
Also, I should say that the education jobs are listed in the News of the Week in Review on Sunday in the Times rather than in the regular classified section. So that's an important thing to know. Jobs in education as well as in human services are, are in the News of the Week in Review section. Um, there are lots of individual organizational websites. We have a job uh, section on our website for Children's Aid. We have a thousand full-time employees, so and we do a lot of work in schools. So, you know, we're a place that hires people who are who want to work in schools as well as who want to work in community settings. Um, and lots of people I know have gotten jobs through Craigslist and other kind of more generic um, websites particularly websites that kind of cater to the nonprofit sector. So those those are a few things that I would recommend. That's really useful. Thanks. Um, anyone else? If you want to look at it, we've just come up and take a look at these. I'm through with them, so. Yeah, no, that's really great advice, especially the point about the New York Times I did not know. Yeah. So that's very good to know. Um, the only thing I would add to those, um, well, Ed, Ed Week has, also has a very, has an excellent set of um, email, like daily emails with, with stories um, that you can have more targeted selections. It's my number one resource. Um, but there's also a, a, a extremely vibrant blogging community, since mm -hmm. everybody has opinions okay. on education. Um, and a lot of them are locally targeted. So there are great sort of New York targeted education blogs, Chicago targeted education blogs, almost every, almost every major urban will have. See, and I was told never to believe anything you read on the internet. So, um, if you're interested in becoming a teacher um, in the New York City public schools, um, the way to go about doing it, I think, is mostly the Teaching Fellows Program. Um, and I left some literature. They sent me a box of very heavy pamphlets that you can um, pick on your way out. And I think that that'll explain a lot. Um, I can tell you the starting salary for teachers in New York City is now about $42,000, $45,000. And that's without a master's, which I think is double what it was I started. Um, so I don't know if that's good or bad, I don't know, um, but that's what it is. Um, and I think that one of the ways a lot of people get jobs in teaching is they do sub work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go down to the DOE with a $100 money order, you take your fingerprints, and you get a sub license, and all you need is a bachelor's degree in anything. And then you go around to schools and you say, I want to be a sub, and they hire you for a couple of days here and there, and if they like you, they bring you back. And, they see that you know when you're in the classroom, you're doing a good job. You're not just letting the kids throw things at each other, um, uh, which often happens with subs, and we don't hire those subs back. Um, and then jobs open up in late August. I mean, you talk about August 28th. We hire people on September 1st and 2nd. You know, people come back. We get emails. I'm staying in the Barbados. I'm not coming home. Uh, I need someone <laughs> to fulfill five classes of history. Um, so, and then a lot of times we get people who start in September, and I think with the huge influx of new people coming into teaching, uh, some of those people were never meant to be teachers. And so we find that, yes, there are lots of people coming into teaching, there are also more people who after three weeks or four weeks have thrown up their hands and said, this is not for me, and they run out of the building with their hair on fire, and it's good to be Johnny on the spot uh, and be the person who can come in. So the last couple of years, for a variety of different reasons, um, we've hired people in like late September, early October, and November to fill, fill out a year or to fill out someone's position. Um, so if you're subbing and you're around and you're available, and a lot of times you get people from the, the, the teaching fellows ranks for that. Uh, the other thing that, in terms of being prepared and reading about the field, is each discipline has its own organization. So the mm -hmm. National Teachers of English have a wonderful organization, or National Teachers of Social Studies are um, one of those organizations, and I imagine you can do some kind of search and you'll sort of see, and they have great ideas for lessons and a lot of current ed speak about what's going on, and um, you can even download lesson plans in some cases, and that might be, if you're going for an interview, that might be a good place to get a start to, to pull up a, a lesson plan. Um, so that's one of the things I think a lot of teachers also, if you're a new teacher, uh, definitely join your organization. They have great resources, and they can really help you make your way through your first year teaching. So those are the things I was thinking if you wanted a job, the Teaching Fellows Program. Uh, someone mentioned Teach for America, and there are other ways to do that. If you already have a master's degree, I think it's a little bit different, but you need a master's degree now to teach in the New York City public school system. Private schools are different. You can uh, join, a, I think, Sandoz, so there are a couple of organizations that are headhunters. You send them their information, and they, 
they send your name out and then you get calls back. I remember when I was at Chicago, I joined one of these organizations and I got a job notice about, I forget the name of the school, but it was nestled between the Avocado Hills and the islands off of Los Angeles, I forget what they're called. And I was reading this while it was 60 degrees below zero in my little, my little apartment on Woodlawn saying, oh, please let them call me for an interview. Please let them call me for an interview. Um, and that's actually where I got my first job. It wasn't out in California, nestled among the Avocado Hills. It was in New York City. Um, and uh, they originally had hired someone with more experience, um, but then on, I was going to the New York City Board of Ed teaching whatever the teaching fellows was back in the 80s. And I got a, a phone call when I got home that the person they had wanted didn't want the job, and uh, I got hired in September 1st. So private schools tend to hire earlier. Um, I, I think public education is, is far more exciting and interesting than private school education um, is to be a teacher, but it's not a bad way to get a start because it's a more secure, it's easy to get a job in May and June. So if you're thinking about getting a job and you want to apply, you can usually find out earlier from private schools than public schools. Great, thanks. Um, thinking we'll be, have Russell um, share a few more thoughts on different resources and then if Michael has any additional thoughts on that, then we'll... Yeah. This one, I'm not sure how many thoughts I have to share. That's I, mean, I fine. don't really work with the market for adult education. Um, the main thing is just if, if you're talking to somebody in June and they say they don't have anything, first of all, don't be afraid to ask them if they know of other places out there that do have jobs. And second of all, don't be afraid to, to make sure that they have your name around in case they find themselves in need two months later. It does happen. You know, an awful lot of the hiring is ad hoc because, oh, we need somebody next week or tomorrow. When people are doing their homework and reading about the different um, careers they can enter into, um, we have a wide range of people um, with us today, some people just starting off and some people kind of in the middle of their careers, and so you touched a little on your um, kind of mid-career switch to education, so maybe you can discuss the different resources that you feel that people should read that want to go into your field, and also um, maybe with a particular eye for if you are switching careers and you're just hmm, not really sure if you really like what you're doing at the current moment, um, if you should take any kind of like different tactics. Okay, I'll, I'll just jump right on that point. I, I think it sort of depends on what resources you have at your disposal and also what your interests are. Um, in retrospect, I might have been better served had I worked for a tutoring company, not necessarily as a tutor, so, you know, to understand what tutors do day to day. Um, I've rounded out that expertise by hiring someone who knows far more than me about the tutoring market and what it takes to be a tutor, uh, though I now have that, some of that experience myself. Um, what I would say, though, is if you're, if you're interested in a particular field and you do think that the private sector is what you're interested in, um, again, the networking is so important, and try to find a job that you know, maybe it's not necessarily the job you really, really want, but it's next to the job you want. And so, as Roger was saying before, you might you know, say, I really want to be an administrator uh, who does this in an education company. And you say, well, I mean, the job market's terrible. There's a million people out there right now. Well, maybe you go do something that's a little bit different, but can get you that next job. Mm -hmm. And so I, I took a little bit of a different tack. I, mean, I sort of you know, stopped doing what I was doing and had a very you know, blunt end to it, and then went into something very different. Um, that still running a business and marketing, you're often running a business. So I felt I you know, knew enough, which, you know, you, you learn a lot of lessons on, on the way. Um, so I'd say it sort of depends on what you want, but don't be afraid to be flexible. Again, networking is so important. Um, in my business, a, a lot of tutor, we get a, a lot of wonderful resumes, and we don't necessarily have someone who's the right student for that person at the time. On the other hand, we run across, you know, someone just happened to send their resume, and we happen to get a client at the right time for that person, where suddenly you know, that, that worked out. And you know, sometimes jobs come accidentally. We have a tutor who was, he's a part-time tutor. He works only evenings because he has a full-time job. Well, his last hedge fund went under, and so he got a job at a hedge fund with the client he was teaching. So these kinds of things, you know, again, some of it's right place, right time. You know, it all seems, <coughs> how could this possibly happen? If you cast a lot of lines, you know, there's going to be a fish out there that bites. And so, you know, be bold, be flexible, and do a lot of networking. Um, you know, look for jobs that are interesting enough. You don't want a job that's, you know, a hideous job for you that you're going to hate, 
and that isn't going to get you the next job. But if there is something that you say, you know, these are sort of a range of jobs that I might like. Um, I don't think my experience is necessarily representative of what most people would do because I went so you know, starkly from one career to another. But if you're looking to make that change, there's certainly just through the networking, a lot of, a lot of my business is about parents. So while you know, ultimately we want to teach children, the children aren't hiring us, right. the parents are hiring us. Mm -hmm. And so I keep in touch with educational trends to some degree mm -hmm. by what the parents tell me, because they keep me apprised of what's going on in the school. So if a school is in turmoil, I hear about it. Um, or they tell me, you know, you know they're changing, they're changing this, aspect, this aspect of our curriculum. And so you know, sometimes you get the insider tips just by talking to people. Um, Just one other thing I'm thinking we should toss in here. Um, networking makes sense. It may have sounded as though networking mostly means going and trying to get to know principals or administrators or people who could hire you. It also means going out and meeting the teachers themselves. Um, I mean, the, at the, the first blush is, oh, they're my competition. They're the people who are trying to get the same job I am. But it just doesn't work that way. I mean, an awful lot of times, knowing that they can pass along information to you, they can mention you if there's a job that they can't think of themselves. Just having friends at that level is a very important thing too. It's not just the level above the people who are doing hiring. Right, absolutely. Thanks for mentioning that, Russell. Um, um, I just wanted to add a few, a few more points in that. Um, we've heard about flexibility, um, maintaining an open mind, and um, as you can see, there are so many different, it, see, education isn't about just sitting in front of a classroom. Um, there's so many different avenues you can we take. Stand. Sit stand in front of a classroom, but um, uh, sometimes you might have a certain interest, be moving targets. and you can combine those into into different fields. Um, a lot of different uh, companies, for instance, have learning development programs or training programs for their employees. Um, many of you probably know about them in the companies that you're working in right now. I know where I'm working, we have a learning development program where. We have a set of trainers because people always kind of, no matter if you've been working in the field for three years or 30 years, there are always new skills that you need to learn, um, whether they're in kind of like more substantive areas, say a UN professional that needs to learn more about um, just latest economic trends or, um, or anything of that like. And so sometimes if you go into, you, you might have an interest in international relations or you may have an interest in science, right? Go to an or organization which you think you'd be comfortable working in and see if they have a learning development program, see if they have an education slant or a department within the broader um, scope of their organization, and you might find that. And, um, you know, we talked about resumes that look a little different, have a kind of interesting background. And those are the type of employers that may be interested in you. So definitely think outside of the box sometimes when it comes to the different education um, opportunities and careers that are available to you. Um, I know we're. Uh, just past the 45 minute mark now. Um, Reggie, what do you think? Do you think we have time for a few more questions? Or, yeah? Let's have some questions. Yeah, let's have some questions. I was just going to say that you know, the two best things about teaching, I think, and, and Russell, I probably would agree, that he might have three best things, uh, are July and August. <laughs> and, you know, if you're a college professor, it's often June, July, and August. And uh, it gives you a lot of opportunity during the summer to do some of the other things and maybe get a job as a tutor or maybe work for a software or pursue some of the other interests. So, um, you know, I would certainly encourage people to consider that. But if you have an interview with a teacher, a prospective teacher, who says that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, in the front. Hi. I actually have two years named Raj or Roger? Raj. Raj. Raj, you mentioned that Is that your question? <laughs> yeah. That's the first question. I actually question. Have to address you. Okay. Um, right. two, two questions. You mentioned that you think that public school teaching is actually much more exciting than private school teaching. I wanted to know your insight into that and why you think that. And then with respect to your discussion on substitute teaching, do you have to actually have your teaching certificate to be a substitute teacher in the New York City public schools, or can you do that for, say, a year prior to starting your master's or? or uh, the second, I think the answer to the second one is that as long as you have a bachelor's degree, um, you can go to the Board of Ed and get a sub-license, a common brand sort of sub-license. I don't think you need to have any kind of other teaching certificate. Um, there's a certain amount of time that you have that if you get hired, 
that you had to get a master's degree. You had to have a certain number of special education credits, et cetera. I think No Child Left Behind has pushed that aside, and now pretty much you need to be certified if you want to get a full-time job. But there are shortage areas, and some schools have not gotten everyone certified. I think my school, everyone is now certified. Um, so if you want to work as a sub or you're going back to school and you're taking classes at night and you want to sub during the daytime, I think you just need to have your bachelor's degree and get a, a per diem certificate. I think the per diem right now is about $150 for the Department of Education. I think that's what they're paying people. Does anyone, does that sound right? Does anyone know that? Um, as for the second thing, I think what makes public school exciting is just the diversity of the children that you don't get in a private school. In my class, I have South Asian, Chinese, Polish, Russian, white, black, Caribbean, all in the same class. And it's, it's just, it's such a wealth of, of excitement in that room to have all these kids, many of them, their first kid to graduate high school, the first one who's going to go to college, um, watching the learning curve for those kids. And I, I work with sort of privileged kids. I worked at Hunter High School for a year. I worked at this, you know, I told you this miserable experience at this private, small private school. Um, some of the big private schools, I think, are wonderful places to work at. You know, the Horace Manns and the River, you know, places like that. Those are very well-established schools. But a lot of private schools are sort of small private schools, and do you end up having five preparations because they're so small. They have two sections of seventh grade American history. My first job, I taught, I think, sixth grade English, seventh grade world, eighth grade American, 11th grade economics, and 12th grade world. I was the middle school soccer coach. I never played any soccer in my life. We were unbeaten, we were unbeaten though, I might add. Um, I was middle school basketball coach, uh, and I would have been the middle school softball coach if I had stayed. So it's a very tough job in a lot of the small private schools because they don't have enough sections for you to teach multiple classes of the same thing. So you're kind of spread all over the place. You're, you know, you're doing a club, you're doing the yearbook. So um, it can be difficult. I mean, I have debates all the time. My personal thing is I grew up in the public school system, and the public schools in New York are wonderful, wonderful places. I mean, the elementary schools are, in, in I live in Chelsea, and there were so many. And then I was worried, oh, middle school is such a disaster. Who can? And I was impressed with every one of the middle schools I visited for my kid. And my son is now going to high school next year, so I did a whole high school search. And I was impressed. You know, you have to put 12 schools on the list, and we were able to come up with seven or eight or nine schools that we would have been very happy if he had attended. So I think there are wonderful schools out there, big, small, with you know math and science admission, technology, um, all sorts of different opportunities. So I just think that there's a whole wealth out there. Plus, the pay is a lot better in public schools, and you have a union, which you don't have in private schools. And I hear friends of mine who get you know shafted by their administrators all the time in private schools, and I would never put up with that. Uh, and I don't have to because you know when I was a teacher, I was a member of the union, and there were certain rules about what could or not could or not be done to me. So that would be my. But that's another personal thing. Um, I've kind of did the reverse. I was teaching in Illinois, and my school district helped pay for my MBA at UNC, so I got out of it. So, so now the question is, I am still certified in Illinois. I just kept you know, doing the certification thing. So in New York, does that transfer over? I think there is reciprocity, if that's the right word, uh, between step and reciprocity. Yeah. reciprocity. Um, <laughs> I haven't been to 65 Court Street in a very long time, which is where you have to go to get all of this done in Brooklyn. Um, and you should prepare to spend the day there and bring all of your certificates. You're not, and I guess you've done this before. Yeah. It's a day, right? There's the great deli on the corner, the notary down the road who will... Yeah. Um, but I think that you can get your license, you know, transferred. I think it's fairly easy, yeah. And you go where? 65 Court Street. Borough it's, Hall subway stop. Yeah, everything right. stops at 2, 3, Brooklyn. 4, 5, not part of James. JMZ, uh, yeah. But there's a website. The DOE website has lots of information on this now. Uh, the New York City Department of Education website. Yeah. And they're very helpful now. That wasn't the case before. Yeah, they're much more helpful. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you're going to direct this one to you, but uh, I'm a teacher right now. Um, actually, today is my last day as a first year teacher. Hey, um, congratulations! But I'm thinking about going to law school after teaching, and I was wondering if you guys do, you, you don't do like careers that combine a law degree with working in education. Oh, sure. Yeah, maybe oh, absolutely. DOE has a whole Fresh. legal division. And a friend of mine actually was my student teacher, and she now works for the office of whatever legal. We're constantly calling them. 
<laughs> but also, you know, I mean, think about the big lawsuit that was brought against the New York City, no, the New York State, against New York State around equitable financing of public education. And, you know, Michael Rebell was the lawyer who, what, tried that case? Or um, There are lawyers who are working on all, uh, lots of really important aspects of public education. And, um, you know, to, I, I want to get into this little debate about public versus private. I mean, I think that public, what I love about public education is that to me it is the bedrock of a democracy. And that stuff gets me charged up. I think, and, and so the, the legal side of this about what are children in American society really entitled to, there's a lot of legal work going on on that. And there's, there's a group of people who are thinking about because we did not realize the potential of Brown versus Board, uh, the Board of Education, the Supreme Court case that's over 50 years old, there are people who are thinking about working toward a constitutional amendment that would guarantee the right to a high quality education. So there's some really interesting legal theory about this and um, you might want to talk to Michael Robelli, he's a teacher's college, he's head of the Center for Educational Equity, if that part of the law interests you, but I think there's just some fascinating, there are, there are centers, nonprofit centers that are working on educational issues. At the, there's an educational law center in New Jersey that's, that brought that Abbott case, you know, that worked on the uh, equitable financing of education in New Jersey. So, you know, besides the jobs in the Department of Education, I think there are lots of nonprofit organizations that work on legal aspects of education. So good luck to you, but don't leave the classroom quite so soon. <laughs> figure out what charter schools were, and then I was briefly discussing with Jane, well, what's the difference between a community school and a charter school um, versus uh, a regular public school? So maybe, um, Jane, not to put you on the spot again, maybe you can just give a brief definition mm -hmm. of them, and just so people know exactly mm -hmm. when they see these um, open calls for teachers and such mm -hmm. in the schools, what, what do they mean by that? Okay, so a char how many of you feel like you're confused about that, like what's a charter school? Okay. Um, a lot of people are. So charter has to do with governance. Okay. So uh, the, a charter school is a school that gets a charter. In New York you get it from the state. And the charter allows the school to operate outside the jurisdiction, if you will, of the department. Is this right? Yes. Okay. Of the Department of Education. Uh, in New York State, we currently have a cap on the number of charters that the state is allowed to grant. This is going to be a really hot political issue because Arne Duncan has said that he is not going to reward the state. Well, anyway, don't get me started on it. Okay. It's going to change, but it's about governance. A community school is a school that, this is a simple definition, is a school that compared to a traditional school, has extended hours, extended services, and extended relationships. So it's about the relationship of the school to the community. So a community school is, you know, brings the community in as partner, a partner or community agencies as partners to do the kind of work I described before to add supports and services and opportunities. And a community school also serves the community. So if the school has a computer lab and a swimming pool and you know lots of our schools have very rich resources and a traditional school is closed at 2.30 or 3, is open five days a week, 180 days a year. <coughs> I think that makes no sense. These schools belong to us. So I think that community schools make a lot of sense and Arne Duncan has been saying that every school should be a community school including charter schools. So a charter school can be a community school and a community school can be a charter school. They're really apples and oranges, but they are, they are often talked about as two kind of reforms that are getting a lot of traction in New York City and in other places. I think the big thing about charter schools also is that they don't have to follow the Department of Education and the UFT's rules and regulations about how many classes or rules like that and so that allows them a lot of flexibility. A lot of people have complained that union rules make it very difficult to do good education and the charter school movement I think to some extent was to try to get rid of these silly regulations that 
not all of them are silly, but some of the sillier ones that allowed sort of education to come to the front and put children first. Um, but they're they're usually not union. I think there are some UFT charter schools, but most of them, the teachers are not members of the UFT. And there was a big fight recently at one of the KIPP academies. KIPP is a charter network and a, a set of schools with very good results. And there was an effort to try to unionize some of the teachers right. at I was it in Brooklyn. So anyway, they, yeah. So that's that's kind of the short course on some definitional stuff. So, but they're all public schools, charter schools. Yes, charter schools are public schools. They are publicly funded. Yeah, and generally they can't be selective. Um, they have mm -hmm. to be open to lottery so that they're so that they're truly public and not just a way to get a private school funded with public dollars. A lot of them have a lot of. They get an organization to help them with the startup of the school. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts can open a charter school, and for the first three years, they guarantee you know twenty thousand dollars in in money, and every kid is going to be able to get a pass to the Metropolitan Museum. So they're really wonderful things. The concern that a lot of educators have, I guess I'm one of them. Uh, again, this is my personal viewpoint: is that people are worried that when that initial startup ends and it finishes, be able to offer the same high quality education without that added help from their outside organizations, which often provide a lot of the startup money for them. And depending on, um, I mean, not all of you are necessarily going to stay in New York. I'm not even sure if everyone here is based in New York, but every, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but every state has their own different system of charter schools and the types of charters that they have. Some are more flexible, some are more stringent. Um, so that's something to take into account as well. Um, and some states don't have charter schools. Is, oh, really? Isn't that correct? I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've learned that reading Ed Week recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. President Obama is um, right now a proponent mm -hmm. of charter schools. Mm -hmm. His latest um, aims to improve the education system in the U.S. And so um, it's a very um, hot topic right now. But I, I will say this, though, that the research is very equivocal about whether <coughs> charter schools yeah. are better than traditional schools or better than non-charter schools. There's and when you look at educational research, there's very, there's very few research findings that are definitive. But I would say that that's a very hot topic right now about what do we know, what is the evidence about charter schools? Have they been, you know, one hears about them all the time now. Yes. But have they been around for a very long time, or is it a relatively recent I think it's a relatively new phenomenon, I would say 15 or 20 years. Yes. Yeah, I was involved in the startup of a charter school in Boston in 1994. That was a fairly early one, but mm -hmm. there were a few that preceded that um, in places like Minnesota. Yes. And, and, yeah. and but it's gotten very big recently. In the last 10 years, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years, the number has really increased. Yeah. They're a good place also to start teaching, I think, because mm -hmm. if they don't have the same regulations with all the other things, it might be a good place to sort of get a first job or a second job. Um, and then, you know, if you like it, great. If not, you always have some experience on your resume. You can sort of say, I worked at the school. I had a guy who, um, not a charter school, but he's been working for the last two years for the Department of Corrections on, El on uh, Ellis Island, on um, Rikers, Rikers, Rikers Island. And uh, my attitude was like, well, if you can work there, yeah. you can work anywhere. He says, the kids aren't allowed to have pencils, yeah. you know, or they ha everything has to be brought sort of into the room and is secure. So um, there are lots of school op opportunities besides your traditional public school, I think, to sort of get some experience teaching. And, um, it's a good way to go. So and that set his resume apart, I that think, That set right? his resume apart. <laughs> you know, and also one of the things that, you know, I go back, I talk to a lot of graduate students who come to my school to visit. Now, um, graduate education, if you're going to get a degree in, uh, in education and teaching, you have to do a lot of visiting. I mean, it's hours and hours. It used to be the term before you graduated, you would be student teaching. And I'm sure a lot of you had student teachers when you were in school. It was that person who came in who said, hi, my name is Mike, um, and uh, taught you know, for two or three months. Now it's very different. From the day you start your graduate program, you are visiting schools 25 hours the first semester, 50 hours the second semester. Then you do sort of a phase one where you're sort of in the classroom but not really teaching. And then you do phase two. So they really give you a sense of what teaching is like. And if you're not going to go to grad school, I think you need to do that on your own because I wouldn't suggest anyone commit to teaching unless they've really thought long and hard about it. It's a very different kind of job uh, than a lot of other jobs. And being in front of the classroom five periods a day, you know, standing room only, it's like it's like being a, uh, a you know on Broadway and having to do five shows a day. And it's, it's a grueling work and um, it's the most wonderful job you'll ever have in your life, I think. But some of these jobs sound very good also. Um, and I'll talk to you afterwards about it. <laughs> um, 
but it is, it's very different. And, and I, you know, you talked about, oh, I went to high school. A lot of people think, oh, I went to high school, I can be a teacher. Well, I always say, you know, just because you've flown a plane doesn't mean you can be the captain. And I think a lot of people are under the mistake, you know, oh, Mr. So-and-so was such a bad teacher, I can do that. And, it, you know, maybe you can, um, but it's, it's, it's different. And you really need to be mentally prepared for it. I recently took a basic programming class, and it was interesting to be in a, a global class. I had a lot of former high school students that were learning the for the first time. As much as from a policy decision that we need more scientists and engineers, what is technology going to do for us in the education system and our personal lives? And, you know, this is maybe a little bit more empty to sort of wrestle and read. My good feeling at different levels. You know, what are your thoughts about what technology is? Are you certainly the most technological of us? <laughs> okay. So, it, 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 what what falls under the umbrella of education technology has been has been evolving for decades. But um, some of the interesting things that are that are happening in edu education technology now have to do with uh, creating well creating computer based or computer assisted learning experiences for kids that can be you know, that can be very personalized and very responsive to an individual student's needs. So. You know, and that can range from doing, doing you know, simulation activities or, or games or, or projects of that sort to doing research on the internet all the way to if a child is just learning to read, you know, I mean, some of you have seen the leapfrog or the various, you know, the various technologies. That's a great example of, of education technology um, and, learning, and learning experiences for kids. One of the one of the newer areas um, the technology has come into though is data, and just being able to being able to do assessment work, um, or to be able to cat be able to use data more effectively to diagnose kids' individual needs, so you can target their instruction more effectively. Uh, but then the level above that, being able to pull that data together, so that principals can analyze how well their schools are doing and figure out where their instructional programs are working for kids. And a lot of the controversy and, and opportunity around NCLB has particularly been around the use of data for the management and um, the management of schools uh, and the accountability of schools. Uh, and so that's that's one of the areas that's being talked about. I think there's a lot of great stuff being done. There's some scary stuff being done too. Uh, but I think it's we're at a point when a lot of things going on in education technology can can converge to create different experiences for kids and ultimately help schools do a lot more. I didn't even touch on distance learning, which I think may be the single most important thing to come out of educational technology in this decade. The fact that in a lot of schools where that may only have a limited number of course offerings they can have, the fact that kids, kids can take an AP course from a teacher who's not even in that school. I think that's potentially the biggest single impact of technology right now. Well, I'm a big proponent of technology. I've spent, feels like, endless hours working on computers, and, and now I actually uh, teach people how to use computers, some of whom have hardly ever really touched them before. And I would say, though, still the best, the best computer is the human brain. And a lot, of the, a lot of the students that my company deals with, are they come to us because they're struggling with something. They may be very good students in a lot of ways, but they may be in a hyper-competitive environment and you know, they're just not able to keep up with that one particular subject. And so I'm a big proponent of, of using it for situations where there is no access, such as distance learning, where you know, someone out in the middle of Idaho perhaps doesn't have a teacher for something that they're desperately interested in. Um, and I think in cases where students are interested, um, you don't necessarily need a human being right there all the time. Um, but I, I also would say that um, while we, my company does use technology, and we certainly use it in communication, we use it in now distribution of materials, you don't have to print out books. Um, on the other hand, we still see so much productivity from people working one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and many of these situations in schools, there's just not enough time in the day for teachers to work with all these students who, who might you know, miss a concept, or they've been out for a week because they were sick, swine flu, and, and now they need to catch up. Uh, but in my situation, you know, it's, it's sort of taking the best of technology, but still you know, keeping it very human because you know, a computer can't read a, a student's reaction, negative, you know, negative reaction to, I don't get it. 
the kid may just say, you know, click on the right button you know, accidentally in a computer program. Um, so I feel like you know, while technology will advance, there will be more and more opportunity, um, there will always still be that human element where there is no substitute for a great teacher. Okay. You have a question? Uh, okay. okay. Um, I was just wondering if there's anything specific about your education or experience at the UC that have really helped you in your field currently? Since we're all on the UC panel. I'll tackle that real quick. Um, I talked about flexibility. Um, you know, the early American colonial classes I took with Professor Cook I don't get to teach very much of that, though I do sometimes use my textbooks. But there is no substitute for being smart. And I think that's true in any one of our jobs. And, you know, when you go to the U of C, there are all kinds of people there. They're all very smart. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really prepared me for being a really smart person in my job. And, you know, I have to teach very basic stuff. You know, I'm teaching, you know, the Indus Valley Civilization of Dana. So, you know, maybe I took a whole course on that when I was at Chicago, and I used very little of that. And when I first started teaching, I did use some of my notes and lectures. But I think what I learned and how to think and the idea of sort of opening my mind and all of those things at the U of C was very good and much better, I think, than a lot of my friends who went to other colleges, perhaps. I think I use those skills every day in my job and the way to think about things. I'm an administrator now, and... Um, I come across problems that I never, in any course that I could have taken on administration, would have ever imagined. And I think the ability to sort of problem solve, which I think is something that the U of C sort of did a lot of, though I didn't know it at the time, um, you know, has really helped me. So, I, you know, I think it, it was a great place to get it. I mean, it was a very tough place to get an education. I think it's changed somewhat um, in recent years. But when I was there, boy, was it, it was a tough place to get an education. But they did allow me a lot of opportunities. I remember I wanted to student teach, and there wasn't a student teaching program. And I sort of created my own student teaching program on my own. So it was sort of that idea I had to problem solve on my own, and that was something that was very valuable. At least that's my experience. I, w I would speak to the interdisciplinary nature of the faculty at the School of Social Work. Um, which is, so the quality of the teaching was terrific, but the inter, there were people from all different disciplines, so that was really incredibly helpful. And um, the social work programs typically, and the U of C is like this, I'm glad to know that teaching is following suit now, um, but it, there's always been a practical element to it, so that you're doing field work from day one of social work school, and you're there for two years, so you... You do nine months at one organization and nine months at another organization. There's no substitute for that. The, the only other thing I would mention is that um, I had an opportunity to take a course in social work school from a lawyer, Peggy Rosenheim, who recently died. I just saw that in the um, UFC magazine. But she taught a course called Social Work and the Police, which was unbelievable. And I took it in my last semester. And she had us riding around in squad cars in Chicago. I mean, and it changed my life because it showed me how many job opportunities there were in social work that were in kind of non-traditional settings. And I kind of got itching to get out into the real world, like really out on the front lines as a result of that course. So that's another connection with lawyers. <laughs>
No, that's an excellent point. I think, you know, something that was mentioned was the idea of getting mentors. I think if you work in a school and you sort of, someone who's teaching the same course that you are. So if I'm teaching History 1 and, and you know, he's teaching History 1, you know, find time to sit down and say, you know, can I look at your lessons? Can I see what your projects are? Maybe, you know, to work together. Um, you know, my teaching took off when I was in, working with a group of people uh, in an interdisciplinary program that really allowed us to set common goals, you know, um, and common discipline, you know, sort of have a common ground that all the students knew that we were all going to have the same rules. That was a unique situation. Um, teaching can be very isolated, you know. Some people just like to shut that door and, hey, I'm smarter than all the other teachers out there and I'm going to do it by myself. And I think there's a certain amount of arrogance that people have when they start teaching because it's such a desperate field. They're always sort of desperate for people. And when you go into it, you're saying, I'm going to sort of do it my way. Um, and I think you need a certain amount of that, but I think it would be wrong not to try to to build relationships with your colleagues. Um, you can visit as many classrooms as you can when you first start teaching. It's hard to do, and I think people don't do enough of that. But when you're student teaching, I always encourage that if I'm a student teacher and I'm working with Michael, but I also make my student teachers who come to my school, they have to visit other classes and see other styles and things like that. Because um, I think you just sort of, you know, visiting one person isn't always enough. Um, so, you know, I think you have to accept the fact that you're going to have some failures and not beat yourself up. It's sort of like a baseball play. You go 0 for 4 on Monday. You got to come out Tuesday and you know try to get a base hit that first time up. And I think that's sort of true of teaching. You know, I taught a crappy lesson on Thursday, and you know my assistant principal came in and he gave me an unsatisfactory rating for it. But you know tomorrow I'm going to go in and I'm going to be prepared. And you know it's just a lot of that preparing. It's a lot of you know. And and you're right, students. They're a captive audience. They don't always want to be there. And if you have that eighth period class on Friday and you're trying to get through Hammurabi's code, it's going to be tough. You're going to feel like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, but I think there's a lot that's been done with teaching um, now. There's more mentors. There's more opportunities. There's more ways of sharing lessons. There are more websites that give you opportunities to sort of talk to teachers across. And that can be a very helpful experience. Teaching by yourself is very lonely. Um, and you really want to try to build a, a cadre of people. And if you become a teaching fellow, I think they do that. If you're taking graduate classes, that's a good network there. And people in your building, I think, can be really helpful. Okay, so can I ask just a detail, just a style of something as you're talking? You know, how, does it, how does a teacher define success? That, you know, because many experience, including in mine, that at least some students who are Well, I'd turn that around. You said you just completed your first year teaching, or tomorrow will be your last day of school, I guess, right? Oh, so there you go. So how do you define success after one year? I mean, what do you... I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah. It's, 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 there's a teachable There's moment here. There's another teacher there, too, in the same Yeah, so... I don't know. I mean, I guess we do, in my school, we do it like a standards-based system where, like, you have a set of standards that you want to teach for the year, and then we have a test that we give the kids. We, we plan over the summer for months, like, right, for, like, long-term planning, like, what we want the kids to know by the end of the year as sixth grade math students. And then we give them that test at the first day of class, and then we give them that same test the last day of class um, to see how they progress from what skills they've mastered from what I've taught them. Yeah, I mean, I think content is certainly part of it, but I think for a lot of children, it's not about even the content that they learn. Remember, you're not teaching math or English, you're teaching young people. And if you keep that in mind, for some kids, coming to school every day is a huge success. Um, and for other kids, you know, mastering something. I remember when I first started teaching, I said, oh, I'm only reaching half my class. And my mother, who was a professor for many years, she said, half? I'm lucky if I meet at least five kids a year, I'm thrilled. But her level is, you know, she wanted to change kids' lives as a college professor and make them interested in anthropology. I just want them to pass the Regents exam at the end of the year, sort of a content-based thing. But I think as I've become more wise, um, I realize that for different kids, success is going to be different things. And I don't always know what success is for that kid. And at the end of the year, they'll tell you this was then you, the strangest kids will come up to you and, you know, give you a hug at the end of the year and say, thank you, you know, for everything, Mr. Nan. And I'm like, 
you were like the worst kid in my class. Why are you begging? <laughs> but for that kid, it was a place. They were safe. You know, they loved the subject. It inspired them that maybe next year they're going to go on to an honors class. You know, that they maybe just skated by. Or so I think it depends on each individual kid. And, and as you become more experienced, you can individualize. It's not just large groups that you look at success. You look at success. And, I mean, the educational technology is all about individualizing success for individual students. So I think that down the road, there's going to be more content success for individual students. But as, a, as the human in front of the classroom, you just have to say, you know, what were my goals? My goals were to survive this week, to teach this basic concept. And I think, you know, I've done that and looked. They didn't do so well on the test. But, you know, I'm going to go back. And I think teaching is the three-year process, that the first three years you teach something, you're not going to get it right until the third year. And after three years, you're going to sort of have a portfolio. These are good lesson plans. And I have finally gotten my three lessons on the Indus Valley Civilization. It took me three years of teaching it before I figured it out, but now I know it. You're not going to get it in a year or two. And if you accept that, you'll be way ahead of 90% of the people. I still have trouble accepting that. And I've been doing it for 20 years. So. That's good. Just, just really quickly, just taking it one step further um, beyond teaching, I just want to maybe hear from maybe Greg and Michael on um, uh, how do they measure success? in terms of um, the different teaching techniques that you're using, um, the development that you see in um, the students, the people that you work with. Because it's different than um, the lesson plans that teachers may have and everything. So you use slightly different techniques and such. I'm just, I'm just wondering, are there communities, you, we all don't operate in vacuums, right? Are there communities whereby you measure um, the rate of success of um, your specific initiative? and the way you were going about your teaching techniques and educational techniques? Um, yeah, so I'll answer that really briefly. We, um, you know, my company, we are, we have the mission of improving education and we're also a business. So, you know, we, all, we have our standard business metrics. Is the business growing? Is the business profitable? But, um, but I think what we're really talking about here is the mission metrics. Uh, and, mm -hmm. since, and since the work we do is tools to help teachers provide better and more targeted instruction to kids. We measure ourselves on 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 how many more kids get to the get to the content success goals than that we're getting there without us um, in the classroom. So so it's outcomes. So we have it since we're a data company. We have all that data, and so we can look every year and say. You know, wow! In this in, in this community, 20% more kids got to reading proficiency um, than did last year. So, so you know, our stuff seems to be working. This community, you know, it didn't work, and we have this other data that says they didn't. You know, they used these parts of our product and didn't um, otherwise. But so each year, it's always looking at how many more kids are we helping teachers save, uh, and, and that's a fun way to measure it. It's, it's pretty satisfying for everybody in my company. We, I, I calculated last year, uh, based on our data, that that we were for every employee of my in my company, we were moving one kid to reading proficiency every day. So I was able to tell my employees every morning you wake up and come into work, no matter what you do, no matter what if you if you are cleaning the floors, if you are developing software, if you are on the phone providing customer support. You came in that day, and one kid got to reading proficiency because of the work you did. So come in and do it again tomorrow. And yeah, that was pretty motivating. Okay. Can, I, can I add something here? Because I think uh, this is all great. But I also think that we have to be looking at, are we teaching young people good work habits? You know, the kind of li are we creating lifelong learners? Are we helping young people stay on track? Are we helping them stay engaged? Um, and are we helping them develop career and education aspirations? And all of those are things that we can, you know, we can observe, we can talk to kids about them, but they're all really, you know, they turn out to be really important, right? Particularly the work habits. And so, you know, I, I think that we have to, yes, pay attention to proficiency, no substitute for it, but I think some kids get to proficiency through some things that actually turn them off to learning, and that worries me a lot. Michael, you wanted to ask? Oh, it's, uh, I mean, just my, my business is a little different because we measure success a little less with data, even though I'm Chicago MBA, and it's all about data, um, but really about customer satisfaction. And all of us, you know, to a degree, have customers. Some of our customers are students. Some of them are parents, in my case. And really, just that feedback that you get, 
and taking that feedback and saying, okay, got a good review, but I can do even better. And we can, you know, next time we can serve the customer better in some way. Uh, or we didn't get as good a review, what did we do wrong? And, and we learn a lot. And so even though the person who is my director already has you know, good tutoring, real world experience as a tutor, as an administrator in a tutoring company, um, she's always learning. And so I think that's the excitement that we get from being in education, that we're always learning and our fundamental mission is about teaching and learning. And so our standard is a little less precise, but no less real. I think we reached the end of our program, and uh, I think there'll be some opportunity to do some casual networking right here. So I would like to ask everyone to thank our panelists for this wonderful talk. Well, it's part of appreciation. We would like to give Mr. Jane Glenn thanks very much. Oh, wow. For us. And How cool is that? The rest of our panelists. <laughs> Maybe you can trade up. Oh, this next time. I've been, oh, wow. by the way, I've been really wanting to this nice. Okay, is he plays for the Duke softball. Yeah, so you can come out and play against Duke or Chicago next Thursday night. There you go. Uh, July 2nd, field number 5 at 7 o'clock. On the great lawn. Great lawn. So, all the teachers who are on summer vacation should be there. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, we were talking about resources that you see that how valuable our own um, University of Chicago resources are. So just please always continue to talk to your fellow alumni. Um, search for them in our databases, um, alumni career databases. And, and conversely, please update your alumni databases so alumni can search for you in case they have any questions or ever want any advice. So thank you for coming today.